Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Learn at Lunch webinar. Today, we will hear from Extension Ag Policy Specialist, Dr. Amy, Amy sorry, Hagerman, as she discusses the latest update on ag-focused payments from recent legislation. If you have questions today, you may ask them through the chat window. You can click the chat button at the bottom of the screen to open the chat window. Additional information on farm management topics may be found on the eFarm management page, and I will share this link in the chat. Dr. Hagerman, I will turn it over to you now. All right, thank you, Brent. So I am uh, going to share my screen. So when you guys saw the advertisement for this, it, it said something like impact of delayed payments. And um, at the time we set that topic, that was true. But if any of you had approved CFAP one or two uh, applications, you've probably already received your payment sometime in April for this latest distribution. So I took a little presenter's prerogative. I changed it a little bit. We're gonna talk about CFAP payment distribution. This is very relevant given the uh, reintroduction of CFAP to the ability to put in new applications. And so that's what I wanna focus on a little bit for today. There we go, okay. So we're gonna start off just talking about CFAP one and two. Looking back at those programs, um, I'm not gonna talk a huge amount about the new payments for CFAP one and two under pandemic assistance for producers, the new program, but I'll talk about how they connect, how it's expanded some of those new uh, issues. And then we're also gonna talk about something else that happened kind of under the same funding, which is this debt forgiveness for socially disadvantaged farmers under the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, so we're gonna try to touch on all of those things. So first, let's just talk a little bit about CFAP 1 and 2. So uh, when CFAP was originally announced back in the spring of 2020, it was to provide $16 billion in direct producer payments and $3 billion in purchases of produce, meat, and dairy. This first round, the CFAP 1, what we commonly think of, was a trigger price-based program. It took prices in January and prices in March. And if there was more than a 5% decline between two days in that period, those two days, then it, that commodity would receive a payment under CFAP 1. They actually broke it into two separate payments with the idea that the second 20% uh, would be issued if there was enough funds left over, depending on how many people applied for this program. But really there was one specific thing that especially for a lot of our livestock producers kind of limited the CFAP one. And it was that livestock or crops already under risk management, already under some sort of contract as of depending on which it was, uh, January 15th or March 15th were actually excluded from the program. Um, and for a lot of our eligible crops under the CFAP one, it was based on unsold inventory by January 15th. So what this actually ended up doing for us under CFAP one is that it really focused a lot, at least here in Oklahoma, for our cattle producers in the state. So just digging a little bit deeper into our state, you can see that $326 million dollars of the $347 million in payments actually went to cattle producers in the state. There's some very good reasons for this and timing is a big part of that. Um, thinking about this time period, they're covering January to March and then inventory payments from March um, out into you know, May, June, going a little bit further out as we got into some of the subsequent payments. Uh, we had a lot of stockers here in the state during that time. We had a lot of cows that were calving during that time and we'll kind of get into some of that, how that subsequently affected the program. But you know, there were just a lot of cattle producers. This created uh, some challenges in terms of outreach for this program because we were reaching out to people who maybe hadn't had an opportunity to apply for a program like this before. So, um, you know, Thinking about this Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, where we really have a lot of those, NAS does just in the last two years, in 2020 and 2021, have put out a K-12 
calves, heifers, and steers on small grains grazing number um, that's, that I'm just gonna kind of broadly call stalkers. Uh, so that's 1.65 million head across this three state area. And then you know, we've got a big beef cow herd across these three states. We got a lot of cattle on feed across these three states. So if you look at CFAP1 payments in all three states, that's about $1.12 billion uh, that went to cattle producers just in these three states. That's about a quarter of all CFAP1 payments for cattle across the United States went into this three state area. And I do think a lot of that has to do with the fact, and Daryl Peel has talked about this a lot of times, that we have cattle, calves coming in from all over the country that kind of funnel in to the center part of the country during the winter to graze out on winter wheat and then go on into feedlots. Another really interesting quirk of this program is those cattle could actually receive two separate payments, the same cattle could. So let's say they were sold early March, going into a feeding operation. There could both be a sales-based payments on, under CFAP1 for those stockers in early March, and there could be an inventory-based payment for those cattle later on in the year. And, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the consequences of that. So these inventory-based payments really made up about half of the total for this. Um, there were a lot of cattle on feed that were under contract or had other risk management. And, and, and so even though there were very high payments per head for cattle on feed, reflecting those supply chain disruptions and what that meant, um, we also you know, have some pretty good risk management usage in that group of producers. Stockers not under risk management that were sold before March 15th may have made up a pretty good portion of that total, but really there's no way to know for sure. They don't break the numbers down enough and we don't have the kind of data collected on stockers to really know for 2020, how many producers sold their cattle before March 15th and got them off of that wheat pasture and how many were kind of trying to ride out the market and hold them a little bit past that March 15th deadline because at the time those decisions were made, we didn't know that those would be those kinds of cutoffs, right? So um, I think that was a big challenge for us here during CFAP 1. Then we moved into CFAP 2. This happened in the fall. It started out the first round of CFAP 2 into December 11th. This really threw the doors open in terms of the number of eligible commodities. The reason being CFAP 1 was really about that initial shock in the spring. CFAP2 recognized these continued uh, market disruptions associated with COVID and, and recognizing this change in how people were eating and the consequences that had for prices. Uh, so there were three different ways prices could be done. We have trigger prices, uh, this happened for cattle, some of our, uh, our commodity crops. And then also flat rates, $15 per acre. This is if you didn't have enough data to really calculate that trigger price payment, they would do this flat rate. And then we had sales-based commodities. And this opened the door up, especially here in Oklahoma for some of our horticultural crop producers, uh, you know, some of our small, like our, our sheep and goat producers. So this, this opened the door up a little bit more additional payments. And, and we see this in this figure where you see this distribution of payments across um, all the different categories. So nationally, corn had the highest levels of payments. These sales commodities, which is going to include a lot of our specialty crops, uh, that, that was the third one. And then soybeans, there was a uh, pretty good dairy-based payments. Wheat, yeah, right? So we got to talk about wheat. wheat. Winter wheat was not included in CFAP1. So CFAP2 was the first opportunity for uh, winter wheat payments. And, and here in Oklahoma, we say that reflected. Now, of course, cattle was still that top, um, that top application numbers that were put in, the top dollars that went back out to producers, but wheat was right there at number two. And what I wanna really talk about now, just moving forward from this point, is the uptake of the whole uh, CFAP process. So when we talk about uptake, um, we're talking about among the eligible population, how many people actually took advantage of the program? That's actually really hard to estimate for CFAP. 
you know, the data doesn't really get down that deep, but we can get a little bit closer with a couple of our commodities under CFAP2 simply because it, it, they were very much inventory based uh, values. And so we can go back and we can look at those inventories and we can see what kind of uptake we, we may have actually had for some of those. So let's start with wheat, this tr uh, price trigger base payment of 54 cent per bushel. Um, this was the first time wheat producers had had a payment under the CFAP program here in Oklahoma because we have winter wheat. And we had about 86% uptake by my calculations, meaning that 86% of our wheat production for 2020 received a payment. That is a very good level of uptake for any kind of program. I mean, obviously you're gonna have some people who are eligible for other reasons. You know, you may have some people who just simply choose not to participate in the program. So, um, but, but for any kind of program, 80s, almost 90%, that's really good. Cattle still represented the bulk of our total payments in the state. Uh, this was a fixed $55 per head on non-breeding inventory. And if I look at our number of cattle operations that would have the kinds of cattle that could uh, fall into this, I get about a 60% uptake among our cattle producers in the state. Now, now I've talked to FSA uh, in the past about this, you know, working closely together on on getting information about these programs out. Uh, our state FSA offices did a very good job of reaching out to producers across the state. And, and they based their uptake estimates that, that I had heard based on the number of LFP applications that had happened in the past. That's probably uh, pretty good because that's going to address some of that eligibility. It's going to be people who are familiar uh, with the process of applying for USDA uh, programs. And so that's a little bit higher than this number just based on ag census numbers. So, you know, probably the, the reality in terms of actual eligible populations is going to live somewhere up more than 60% but maybe not quite as much as that uptake for the LFP program, which was probably closer to that 80%. So, um, you know, I guess my next question then, maybe, okay, uh, that I would like to ask this group is, why did producers choose not to participate in CFAP1 or CFAP2? And Brent's gonna bring up a poll question I just threw some, some options there. You can choose more than one, but I think this is really relevant for us to think about, especially in terms of extension. How can we reach audiences that may not have um, had exposure to these kinds of programs before? This was a really uh, new experience for some cattle producers in the state. So, uh, just in terms of thinking about lessons learned from CFAP, I'd really like to think about how we can better reach out to those groups because there's two parts to that, right? There's the part where we would say we weren't able to reach those groups or there was some part of that process that just frustrated them to the point that they just couldn't bring themselves to apply for the program. And, and so I think both of those things are really important. That's the kind of feedback that USDA is going to be looking for. It's the kind of feedback that we're looking for on how we can do this better in the future. So we'll leave that up just for a few more seconds to let people kind of get, uh, get their thoughts in. But just for your producers that you work with for yourself, if you are a producer, and uh, you know, why would you choose not, maybe not even for CFAP one or two, but for any kinds of these programs, why you might choose not to do it. Okay, so thank you for that, Brent. So confusion about eligibility, I think especially with all the changes that happened between CFAP one and two. CFAP one, is it covered under contract? Is it not? CFAP two, it's your inventory, but only your non-breeding inventory. And what is non-breeding inventory by the definition? So I, I think that there's a, there was a lot of confusion in, in how the changes happened between the two programs. 
um, in, in that process. And then the not sure how to apply. Yeah, you get new people who have never applied for a program like this before. And um, where do I begin? What, what do I even have to turn in? How, how do I do this? Uh, especially trying to do this in the midst of a pandemic, of course, that creates yeah, even more potential for either frustration or confusion with the process. So we will go ahead and close those. And then just in the chat, um, you know, are those reasons that we in Extension can help producers overcome? Are those things that we can do a better job of outreach, that we can do a better job of clarification to help people overcome? And so I just like to say, you know, in the chat, especially those of you who are either at FSA offices across the state or, or perhaps those who are uh, educators across the state, if you had a particular um, way you helped overcome some of those things that you think worked pretty well, uh, just some ways to outreach, or you can unmute and just talk if, uh, to the wider group if you want to. But I'm really interested in this, how can we overcome some of those results? Amy, I know for, for me, there was about three or four producers that all I did was call them and say, you need to call your FSA office and go in there. And, you know, these are people who are involved in clubs, involved in stuff like that. And they didn't really know about it yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they said so they would have eventually found out about it, but uh, we're lucky we've got a really proactive FSA office in K County as well. So they jumped on that pretty quick and we're pretty, we're, as happy as one could be with the government payments. So, yeah. 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 And, and then sometimes that's what it is, you know, especially you got people who are busy. They're really busy. And then, so it's just that reaching out directly. How can we, how can we do that? So then I guess this comes into this next point. So what, why go through all this? Why talk about uptake? Why, why do we talk about who hasn't applied? For these programs yet and how we can overcome that. It's because the new CFAP2 application process that's open right now is really trying to, to pick up anybody who is eligible that did not apply for CFAP2 in the first round. And there are some specific targets that USDA is looking for there. But I think, you know, we did a pretty broad education effort jointly across the state for CFAP1 and CFAP2. Uh, and, and so that's part of the reason I'm really interested in this question of, I think we had good uptake here in the state. I really do. If I look at our numbers as compared to similarly calculated numbers, and for some of our neighbors, we're right on par, even a little better in some areas. So, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of success there, um, but I also think that we can, in this extended CFAP2 process, we can reach even more folks. So, especially if we can address some of those issues, like for example, with uh, being unsure if they're eligible or not, uh, I think that's one we could definitely approach. So if anybody has uh, any thoughts into how to better do outreach or groups that maybe we didn't do uh, a great job of doing outreach for uh, either, you know, you can pop something in the chat or you could even just email me directly if you have some ideas, some thoughts for me. Okay. Let's move on. So what's new? Uh, and I've alluded to this a little bit, USDA's pandemic assistance for producers announced March 24th that includes expansions of the existing program, CFAP2, and then some new programs as well. Some additional money for, for things that are not underneath the CFAP umbrella. Um, and, and I think we could see some more of that, some announcement of different programs that don't really fall under the CFAP umbrella. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the first are these top-off payments. And like I said, this was originally uh, what I was going to talk about is what we could expect in terms of the top-off payments, but I think a lot of people have already received their top-off payment. 
at this point. So for cattle producers who had an approved application under CFAP 1, USDA uh, had set aside about $1.1 billion for additional payments for those producers and then top off payments for crop producers who had approved applications under CFAP 2, that $20 per acre uh, level. Again, that, that's probably already come through to people's accounts. But now we also have this additional sign up period for CFAP 2. It started April 5th. There's no closing date on that at this time, but they said it'd be open at least 60 days, which if I did my math correctly is about June 4th. Um, how do we reach those that didn't apply previously? And, and that's really one of USDA in this announcement. This is one of the things they said. They want to make sure we're reaching everyone to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to apply for this program, which is part of my reason for asking those questions in the polls. So thank you guys for your feedback on that. And we do have some new commodities, you know, here in Oklahoma, turf grass is one of those things that is new under CFAP2. So hopefully some of our uh, horticultural crop producers, our turf grass producers, will have an opportunity to apply for this program under this new period. There's also $6 billion in other kinds of programs that don't necessarily fall under the CFAP umbrella. We're used to thinking of CFAP in terms of the agricultural payments for COVID-19 relief programs. But there's more than that uh, now under this pandemic assistance for producers. So there's compensation for those who had euthanized livestock that are eligible. Uh, you know, we think about our hog producers. You guys probably saw some of that in the news, hog and also poultry producers who, because of supply chain disruptions, those animals just weren't able to move in, in through the process. So maybe some compensations for those individuals, compensation for milk that was dumped or donated. Uh, we know we saw some of this in, in the state. I, I know there was some very odd sort of milk being given away on street corners things happening <laughs> in, in a little town near where I grew up. Um, expanded support for local or urban and organic producers. I think extension really has a role in there and knowing those individuals and how to help reach individuals for our and so Dr. Hagerman, are you there? I don't hear you. Okay, uh, bolstering to other programs as well. And we have some of these programs that we utilize here in Oklahoma, uh, LAMP, Healthy Eating Initiatives under SNAP, looking at incentives for domestic cotton milling and manufacturing incentives. We have a pretty good size uh, group of cotton producers and ginning here in the state. And then there's also NEFA grants to help uh, bolster some of these areas as well. So, you know, whenever you have any kind of large scale disaster, pretty much the first thing you do is what they call a hot wash, where they go in and they say, okay, what did we learn? Uh, and how can we do better the next time around? And, and I look at a lot of these and what I'm really seeing are kind of hot wash items. What can we do to continue to support people in um, this? COVID-19 in the state just to see if anybody might be interested in doing something in this area. Um, I didn't get 
uh, uh, anybody jumping up and down with excitement yet at this point. But if you're interested and you need some supporting information about CFAP2, please give me a call. I'm very happy uh, to help support that in any way that I can, making sure that we reach every producer who is eligible in the state for this program. Okay, so now uh, I'll stop right there and just, are there any questions related to CFAP2 before we get into the second topic that was also kind of under that American Rescue Plan Act of 2021? I got to shift windows to get to the chat. There we go. Okay, got a couple of requests for information. Can definitely do that. All right, well, then we're going to move on to the second topic, which was also in the news quite a bit, and that's the debt forgiveness under the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. I did send out an email to the educators that are on here uh, that included a frequently asked question document provided by FSA and also an email address contact for someone at FSA for additional questions on this topic. So I'm gonna brush just kind of over the top level of it to provide some information. But uh, if you did not get that FAQ or if you'd like me to send it again, just let me know. Slides are being really slow to turn now. Okay, so some highlights of what we know now. So this is forgiveness of qualified USDA debt for eligible individuals for balances as of January 1st, 2021. That date is really important when you're thinking about this program. Um, it's only for active USDA direct and guaranteed loans there are other kinds of loans that are not included that the FAQ goes into more detail on that. In fact, this first bullet is a direct quote from that FAQ. Um, socially disadvantaged in this case means including those who identify, I'm gonna move some windows, as one or more of the following, Black, American, Indian, Alaskan, Native, Hispanic, Asian, and Hawaiian Pacific Islander. So, you know, there's, in other kinds of programs for historically underserved, we would may, maybe have women producers in that or veterans in, in some of those definitions as well. In this case, it is only uh, if that person who is a woman who or who is a veteran also meets this definition of socially disadvantaged to be eligible for that debt forgiveness. So just a couple of notes. Uh, you know, one is that keep making payments. You know, I, I think I, I had a, at least one phone call where someone was kind of asking, I was like, well, should I keep making payments or not? Um, it's not going to reduce or increase the debt forgiveness to do otherwise, to do that. It's that January 1 date. Um, also a note that, it, you know, in 2020, foreclosures and debt collection were suspended in recognition of the difficult economic times of 2020. And those suspensions are still in place to my knowledge, uh, unless something has changed in the last couple of days since I had checked on them. Also new loans made after January 1 don't qualify. So if someone saw this announcement and then thought, oh, well, I'm gonna take out a loan, uh, that's not going to be eligible for debt forgiveness. It's, it's um, just outstanding balances as of January 1. So the state FSA office has offered assistance. Uh, it also, if you want someone to do a presentation in your area on this topic, and I've put, um, oh, I misspelled her name. It's Maddie with two Ds. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so ignore the misspelling, but uh, contact Maddie Aylwine for more information on that. Okay, so final thoughts. Uh, we may not see any further CFAP funds for 2021 after this, this final amount is paid out, the top off payments plus the additional payments under CFAP too. We may see some different programs though, and we may see some additional stimulus bills. They're being discussed right now. We don't really know what it's going to look like yet for that. Um, 
But some of these things may have different names than CFAP2, but they'll still be support for agriculture. So kind of stay tuned for some of that information. And then um, there's a survey link here for this webinar to provide feedback for the survey link. So please, uh, I'd welcome any questions you guys might have. But otherwise, please fill out the survey. I, I go up for tenure in a few years, so any kind of feedback is very helpful. Please fill out the survey. <laughs> any questions? Amy, I'm assuming new and beginning farmers aren't on that socially disadvantaged list as well, correct? They are if they meet the definition of socially disadvantaged there. Gotcha. Uh, so, so if you have a new and beginning producer who is also Native American, then they would be eligible, for example. Right. Although there is some really exciting kind of uh, uh, information and some, some, I don't know, promotion coming soon for new and beginning farmer programs. So I would say stay tuned because there will be some push and some new information out in that area as well. It would be completely separate from this. Do you know if um, people seeking um, uh, this program under the um, socially disadvantaged, do they have to prove their ethnicity? So there is a form they they fill out. Uh, I don't know the exact details of what all is included on that. There's a section in the FAQ. Did you get that one, Bradley? Did you get that FAQ? Because I can resend it to you. Uh, it, it actually, you might have. I just might have missed it. Uh, if you uh, send that to me, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll send it to you again because there is there's a there's a specific form that they need to fill out to have on file with FSA, but I am not aware of exactly what kind of proof, if any, would go on that. Amy? Hey, Amy? Yes. According to what I've been told, there's no, you, they cannot ask for any type of proof of self-certification. Unless you get audited, then you have to provide proof. So if you're not, and you say claim you are, you roll the dice and hope you don't get audited. So, but right. now, because, because the way I got explained to me is not every social ethnic group carries a card that says they belong to that group. So they can't ask one group for the card if the other group does not have. American Samoan, for example, do not carry cards that say they're American Samoan. So mm -hmm. you can't ask them and ask the Native Americans to provide that. That's, that's the explanation that's been told to me. And, and that would be completely in line with how other, you know, kinds of situations have been handled within USDA. So there's absolute precedent for that. Um, like I said, I, I think there's just a form that they have to fill out to put on their file at FSA. And that's about the extent of it. But I, it's got the form number on that FAQ Bradley. So I'll send that to you. There's another chat question here. There is. It was a request for the FAQ form. That okay. You know. I am. And I also um, pasted the link to the webinar survey that Dr. Hagerman mentioned in her presentation. I pasted that into the chat box as well for you to click on the link there to fill out. All right, so the last thing I'll say, particularly on this debt forgiveness, is this is going to have some tax implications. JC is already following, uh, you know, kind of some of what those tax implications might be. That's probably something that after more details on how the debt forgiveness will be handled comes out, then we would get more into those tax implications. But that's really not something we can touch on all that much until after those uh those specific details of how it will be handled comes out. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you guys very much for your time this morning, well, this afternoon. Uh, I appreciate it.
And uh, if you have any interest in additional programming on any of these areas, please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Hagerman. And I would also like to thank everyone for joining us today and let you know our next webinar is scheduled for May 18th and Roger Sauls will discuss land tenure and pasture and cropland rental rates here in Oklahoma. So that will be May 18th at noon. So I don't see any other questions. So uh, I'm going to wrap up the meeting. Thanks again and we will see you on the 18th.